You want to hear innovative, practical and efficient ways the construction sector with all its stakeholders can get together to accelerate the transition to net zero and build a climate resilient society. Well, you're in the right place. We are at the crossroads, as Charlotte said, of climate crisis, energy crisis, rapid urbanization in emerging markets, social issues as well, natural resource preservation. So we need this global, fast, comprehensive mobilization of all the sector. So that's the goal of being together today. We all know that it's not a one-sided challenge, but truly we need a collective call for action. This barometer, the Sustainable Construction Barometer, was carried out between November 2022 and January 2023. Sustainable construction is considered a priority issue for every respondent everywhere in the world. And in fact, 89% say that we need to go even further. Our study reveals also that there's a gap between the recognition of the urgency and the reality of sustainable construction today. Say hello to everyone, and I have my own survey. How many of you have ever done a life cycle assessment model for a building, or a building LCA? Okay, so we wanna see more of those hands raised in five years. There are impacts in emissions along that entire trajectory along the, throughout the building life cycle. So part of my advocacy journey has been saying that that matters. And part of my firm's journey has been saying that that matters and that we should be able to measure it. And if we can measure it and model it, then we can use it as part of decision making. There is quite a challenge to make a whole industry go for transformation. Yet again, when we have a common course and direction, it makes it all so much easier. And I so agree on the importance of knowing your measurements, your facts, your figures, and your proof points. I think for all of us to actually challenge ourselves, what construction can do, how we can add on value, when it comes to not only environment, even though that being a major driver, but also from other aspects like health, actually like work environment, or for that case, for the value of our customers. What if uh, next time when you go to the bank, you claim that because my house is green, I want a lower interest rate? And any bank anywhere in the world will give you a better mortgage. We now, uh, since last year, we, invest, we certified $62 billion of assets and we invested last year $2.2 billion in green buildings. That was the highest investment that we have done so far in green buildings. One of the things I desperately need to demonstrate as an architect is the value of building. Why, why do we have to build in the first place? And is the answer to that actually worth the carbon expenditure? If it is, then why aren't we looking at reusing buildings? You want the benefit of the savings and conditions of a green building to benefit the end user, and the end user that needs it the most is not the millionaire sitting in a, in a mansion, is the person that pays 20% of their salary to, to energy bills, right? Those are the people that they really need this, and they really need better financing, and that's the, that's the area that, that we are reaching. There is evidence that demand for green buildings, specifically sustainable building features, is high in developed countries, but such demand for energy efficient buildings or green buildings in general is low or non-existing in developing countries, which is why we see so few investment in green buildings happening in those places. I believe the way forward is to think globally, act globally. I do recognize that you always have to have someone taking up leadership. My conclusion there is how important it is to understand the ecosystem. We need to collaborate and work together.
why is it that it takes so long? And you all know the answer. Um, there's norms, there's standards, there's long cycles uh, of the buildings and materials, but also the fact that cities were built with a certain ID in mind. They were never built with the ID of a fast-changing world. So if we want to now intervene in those long cycles, what are the ways? And that's, I think, from the first panel, norms and standards are really important. How do we go from sustainability to resilience is to understand that we need all of these perspectives all together, all at once. We need to go faster. 400 million people have been impacted by disasters in the last three years. One of the best things we can do is strengthen existing housing. I think we're in a moment of inflection of putting resiliency into our disciplines. I think we're in a work in progress as an industry in what resiliency means. Here it's about systemic challenges. So it, it, it is around even embracing more uncertainty in that empowerment and also asking questions on how even we can draw from nature and nature-based solutions to create those environments where people can thrive in spite of not knowing what's going to happen. When we talk about data, about tools, about better modeling, lots of uh, cities, they have been thinking, and also private and public uh, entities, on what data do they have today and what data is needed for reporting. Now, if you look at planning, we don't always need the 99% uh, certainty of data. If we talk about planning, sometimes 70% is enough. Resiliency is the first word that's going to come up in any climate action conversation. It seems crucial to me to engage communities in the planning and decision-making process. There are still a lot of people who did not realize the problem of climate change is so close to everyone's daily life. I think the builders would like to use the green method, but what choice do they have? At in, for example, in ar area like the most urbanizing uh, uh, areas, like in Asia and in Africa and a small island developing uh, state, what, what choice do they have? Sometimes more often than not, we construct, but we forget about the maintenance after that. We must seize this unique opportunity. I think this is the opportunity to create the condition for a better life for the 8 billion human beings who will be inhabit in the earth, who will be on the earth. So I think we need to come to a realization that our planet consists of two components, nature environment and built environment, and which need to be in sync for sustainable development for present and future generation. We can do it together. If we cannot do it, who else can do it? Truly, we need to measure that will give a lot of credibility, that will trigger a lot of ideas, tools, finance, performance. We are in 76 countries within Sangran, so it's our duty to scale up and speed up. So I've seen how creative finance could be to make money. I'm not sure finance will be as creative to provide sustainable resident buildings. So I think at some point we'll have to go through regulation. We need to listen to people. We need to empower communities taking care not only about the sustainability for the planet, but for us, it's both the planet and the well-being of the people. It's something which is extremely important. I hope it was inspiring and food for thought for all of us. We will continue to invest on low-cost um, affordability, sustainable solutions and resilient buildings. So many thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.